Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. I hope you're doing well, and if you're not, I hope you are soon. All right, so today's video is going to be a little bit different. I wanted to kind of uh, get off the beaten path a little bit, and uh, today's topic is going to be uh, six video games that I think scratch a board game itch. These are video games that I turn to when I feel like playing something like a board game, but I don't feel like getting out a bunch of components. I don't feel like uh, rereading a whole bunch of rules or having to, to learn a game. It's something that I can just throw on and it does scratch that board game itch in my mind. It gives me that same kind of feeling. A lot of these games are kind of that newer kind of like rogue-like genre, which is like super popular and I really like it. There's, there's a lot of real creativity in that space. And um, these are games that you can you can get in pretty quickly, play a game and get out of for the most part. And these are also games that do tend to have a lot of uh, random kind of elements to them, random uh, combat or random events, uh, things to discover. And so I think that all of these games uh, really do appeal to the board game side of my brain. And they're kind of, kind of ordered in how well they emulate a board game with number six being pretty much more of an action game but it still does have some elements. And then number one, I think really does feel like a board game. So let's get right to it. And at number six, we have from 2019, and that is Children of Morta. And that is developed by Dead Mage. I am playing that game currently on the Switch. And I've also played it on the Xbox. On the Switch, I recently bought the, kind of like the complete edition that has all of the expansions and everything. So Children of Morta, it is a roguelike dungeon crawl game where you are playing as a family of heroes. And the rogue, so, so a roguelike, for those of you who don't know if there's anybody who doesn't know what that is uh, still, um, they're based on the old game Rogue or NetHack. And these were older games where they were basically just made with ASCII art. And you would take a hero and you would go from, they were zero to hero games, you know, no campaign, uh, no kind of ongoing comp complicated story. And you would just take a hero and you would go into randomly generated dungeons, dive, uh, delving deeper, deeper and deeper, trying to see how long you could survive, basically getting loot, fighting monsters, and everything was random. And so the modern rogue like takes those kind of elements where you play, you go on a run, you play, you play until you die, and then you start over. However, the roguelike element, the, the new kind of like modern twist is that each game you play, you are developing certain elements of your game, making subsequent games a little easier or unlocking new things for subsequent games. So Children of Morta, you are playing as a family of heroes, a family of adventurers. And part of the things that you are unlocking while you are playing, while you're going on dungeon dives, is you are building up their house, you are building up their abilities, you are opening up like stables and places to raise pets, and you are also unlocking other family members and different abilities. So each time you play, you will have more options of what to bring into your dungeons when you go on your uh, dungeon dives. And there are a ton of really cool random events that happen within the dungeons. And this one, I think, will really appeal to people who who like action games because it, it's very action orientated and it's, it's pretty difficult. But it also will appeal to people who like a really strong, cohesive narrative in their dungeon crawls. And this one has a really good story. It's very emotional. It's got a real it's got a real emotional kick to it because it's dealing with that family unit. You know, kind of like uh, the Ghost Be Twix does a little bit. The Ghost Be Twix kind of reminded me a little bit of Children of Morta in that um, in that way. It, it's got beautiful pixel art, some of the best looking pixel art I've seen. Um, it's not trying to emulate like eight or sixteen bit or even thirty two bit. It looks it looks really modern, but it's done with pixels and great effects, uh, great voice um, acting from the narrator, and just uh, yeah, an all around really fantastic game. And that is Children of Morta. Uh, coming up next is from 2020, and that is Curious Expedition 2, uh, developed by Machinen Mensch. I am playing this on the Switch. I've played the first Curious Expedition on the PlayStation 4, I believe. I can't remember if that was PS4 or Xbox. Um, 
But Curious Expedition is an overland hex crawl. Again, it is kind of this new uh, roguelike where you are going out on a run. You're doing one game, trying to do as good as you can to unlock things to progress in other games. And in this game, it's very much like a pulp adventure, something that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle might have created or um, H. Ryder Haggard. Um, it has a you are you are you're a group of adventurers. You are like the um, the president of, a, of an adventuring club, of an explorers club. You are putting together a group of adventurers and you are going out and you are um, exploring lost islands, basically, um, you know, kind of like a Jurassic, <laughs> Jurassic islands, uh, you know, lost expeditions to to underground uh, cavernous realms where there are lizard people and dinosaurs. And, uh, you know, you might go into volcanoes and find weird temples. You will find native people living in their in their land and you will try to develop trade with them. And as you are exploring the hexes of this island, you are revealing more and more of the island and you are revealing more and more things to do. There are more and more random events and combat. Um, Curious Expedition actually uses dice for its mechanisms. So when you do combat or when you have any kind of like interaction, a uh, you know, some kind of social interaction with the with the other people on the island, you your characters all will roll certain dice and they will be good in certain things. You have to maintain a lot of um, there's a lot of resource management. I can see this game really appealing to people who like resource management and who like um, kind of like action selection because the characters that you bring in, they will all be good at different things and they will offer up different dice. Um, I think um, if you are a fan of games like Robinson Crusoe, I think you might really like this game. It's a little more random than Robinson Crusoe, but it does have that same kind of feel to it. So that was Curious Expedition 2. Okay, and then coming up next, and this is in uh, third here, and this is uh, the newest game on the list and the game that I've played the least of, but I'm really enjoying it. I'm playing it right now. And that is from 2022, and that is Citizen Sleeper. And that is on the Xbox Series S I'm playing that. And that is from Jump Over the Age Games. Um, Citizen Sleeper is a cyberpunk adventure game that really does feel like you are playing a tabletop game. Um, it actually has dice that you are rolling and you are assigning those dice to certain actions in the game. So in the game, you are this kind of like um, this weird kind of like AI Android thing that has awoken and you don't really know who you are. You're on this kind of space station thing in this in this uh, weird futuristic cyberpunk world. And you just kind of have to get by in this new world and, and figure out how to live in this world. And one of the first things you do is the, is the person who who like wakes you up, who brings you into your new existence. You kind of have to work for him and do jobs. And you can go on these really kind of menial jobs and you're trying to earn money. You're trying to earn cred with the uh, different factions on this weird space station thing. And a lot of the game is just uh, text boxes. It's got a it's got some graphics for the world. But as you move around from section to section, you are just moving a cursor. You go into a section, it opens up a text box. You read a little text adventure. Um, it tells you what you need to do. Your character each day rolls a certain number of dice. You assign, you can assign those dice to take actions and you're building up these actions over time. This is not a roguelike. This is an ongoing kind of campaign RPG. Um, so if you like text adventure style games, that have kind of a modern overlay of graphics, I think you would really like Citizen Sleeper. The writing, the, the grammar, the writing isn't great. I think that it was, um, I don't think that English is the designer's first language. And some of the, I don't know if it's, it's, if it's a translation issue, but just some of it just feels a little rough around the edges, a little rougher than I would like in a game like this because the text is so important. But the story and the things that are happening are really well done. I, I'm really enjoying it. I'm, I'm kind of just ca captivated by this world. The art, when it shows the character, uh, portraits look really, really nice. Um, it is a little clunky to move around the interface. So I guess 
I'm kind of hoping that maybe they, this game gets further developed and maybe a big patch comes. It's not broken or anything, but it just feels like it could use just a little bit more polish in a number of areas. But there are random things that will happen. You will have chance meetings with NPCs. You will have to kind of go off and figure out, you know, which faction do you want to do jobs for? All while you're trying to piece together together this mystery of who you are and your place in the world. So really interesting, a different, it's a pretty chill game. Um, it's not action packed. It's more of you're rolling dice, deciding how to uh, apply those dice to actions, and then moving around the station, reading text and, and putting together a mystery. So yeah, pretty cool game, Citizen Sleeper. And uh, coming up next is the oldest game on this list, but it's not that old. And that's from 2015. And that is Guild of Dungeoneering. And I am playing the ultimate version now that came out somewhat recently. But the um, original version that I played was on iOS. And uh, that is from Gambrinus Games. And um, Guild of Dungeoneering is really fun. It's got a great um, kind of hand-drawn art style. It looks like it's all on graph paper. So Guild of Dungeoneering is what I was expecting. Uh, that game D6, Dungeons, Dames, Dice, Danger, uh, you know. You remember the game. I, I reviewed it. It was not a good game at all, but it was a beautiful looking production and it had that kind of like quality where it was it was a kind of a meta game where you were playing characters playing an RPG, but I never really felt that while playing D6. Guild of Dungeoneering has that quality and it is a great game. It is a much better game than D6. In this game, you are building up your guild of adventurers. And as you build your guild, it's kind of like a little like Sim City, but for your guild, you're adding uh, rooms to your guild to attract new adventurers to come into your guild. And then you are choosing adventurers to go out into a dungeon, to go on dungeon dives, and to get loot and fight monsters and get XP and bring all that stuff back so you can make your uh, guild bigger. It's got a really nice loop to it like that. But the interesting thing about Guild of Dungeoneers is when you go into the dungeon, you are not moving your character through a dungeon. You are actually building from a deck of cards. You are actually building the dungeon. And as you build the dungeon, you will, you will find rooms that have loot. You'll find rooms that have monsters. And eventually you will find rooms that have bosses. And you want to place those cards in such a way that it entices your adventurer to go towards the direction that you want him or her to go to. Really cool. It's got a really in, um, simple but good battle system uh, with a deck of cards. Your heroes will have different cards that they can take into battle as they gain XP, as you, as you, uh, as you entice more powerful adventurers to join your guild, your decks of uh, battle cards become stronger and you fight monsters with a deck of cards and with different abilities. So really, really fun game. It's very charming. It's got a good sense of humor and it just has a great look. If you are into drawing dungeons on graph paper, if you grew up doing that or if you're still doing it now and you like the idea of, of kind of a of a dungeon and guild simulator, but not one that takes a ton of brain power. This isn't it's not a super thinky game. It's not like a it's not it's not quite sim dungeon, but it has elements of that. Then this really might be a game for you. And that was Guild of Dungeoneering. Uh, coming up next is uh, the, the uh, last two games, five and six, are probably probably the most complex games on this list, and they can take quite a bit to really get into and to really get the most out of. But at number five from 2017, and I am playing that on the Switch, and that is Tangle Deep, and that is from Impact Gameworks, and this is also available on Steam and PC. Uh, Tangle Deep is probably the closest thing to a traditional rogue style game that I really enjoy. It doesn't look like rogue. It doesn't look like NetHack. It has a really beautiful kind of 16, 32 bit pixel look to it. It's got fantastic music and, but it is a traditional, more of a traditional rogue style game in that it's, um, Every time your character moves and the dungeons are based on grids and every time you take a move or you take an action, the dungeon reacts as well. And so you kind of have to puzzle out how you are going to be maneuvering through the dungeons, 
through the different dangerous um, terrains and dangerous places. Because every time you take a step, every time you drink a potion, every time you cast a spell, every time you take a turn, all of the monsters take a turn too. And it's got a whole bunch of different um, character classes, tons of character classes that you can pick that all have different abilities. There are different house rules that you can uh, set up to make the games more difficult or more easy, depending on what you want. And you can set those up on a game by game basis, which is really, really great. It has um, it has like pet development, you know, pet raising. You can have different you can capture monsters, bring them back to a monster pin and develop those monsters and then bring those monsters with you into uh, subsequent dungeons. It has a little town system where as you are, you can go back to your town to store items and to kind of build up a little stable of, of, of power in order to make other games easier. But the game itself, the, the dungeon diving is really fantastic. It's super um, entertaining. It, it does take some time, though. It, it, it can be a pretty difficult game. It doesn't hold your hand a lot. There are a lot of systems. When you go into that uh, character screen, when you go into your inventory screen, it can be somewhat overwhelming. There, there's a lot going on. There's a ton of loot. There are a ton of different abilities and skills and just all kinds of things. So if you like a lot of systems, if you like games like, uh, I think like Gloomhaven or Mage Knight, games like that where you can really sink a lot of time into, you can really put your mind to it, and you can really develop a good strategy, but it, at the same time, it still has these elements of luck. It still has these elements of going on runs of you might have a really good run, you might have a really bad run, and that that luck element still um, still matters. Another thing you can do is you can have these weapons that are kind of like artifacts, and you can place them on a pedestal, and you can kind of go into the weapons. And um, as you go in. To these special weapon dungeons you can unlock more powerful weapons also it's pretty cool kind of like disgaea disgaea the old uh, uh japanese turn-based strategy game you could go into uh different items and they would have like hundred level dungeons in a sword uh stuff like that it's really great i love tingle deep so much and um i really can't say enough thing about enough about the way it looks and sounds the soundtrack is just gorgeous especially if you like that old kind of uh Super Nintendo and Sega Saturn style uh, look, I think you will like Tangle Deep. And finally, at number one, and I am playing that on the PlayStation 4, and that is from 2017, and that is For the King from Iron Oak Games. Um, I recently said this on the Facebook group, but if For the King was a board game, it would probably be my number one board game of all time. It would also be a game that had like six huge boxes with thousands of cards and components. It would be completely like just unwieldy to get to the table, to store, to play, to set up, to take down. It would take forever. I'm so happy that this isn't a board game. I am so happy that this game exists in the digital realm just because of the breadth of experiences that this game has to offer. So For the King is a uh, overland hex crawl game where you are taking a party each game. It, it's a roguelike. It, it's kind of like imagine uh, Runebound being a roguelike. Um, if you like games like Runebound, if you like games like uh, the one I recently reviewed, the Expedition to Skull Island, you know, if you like these kind of overland hex crawl games, uh, this it, there isn't a better one than that I know of than For the King. But uh, and For the King. The, the, the setup is the king has died and you take a party of three adventurers out in this world to kind of figure out what is going to happen next. And you have a timer where evil is coming into this world and you have to you have to do your quests before evil takes over the world. There are ways to mitigate that. There are ways to push evil back so you can get more time. But you are going on these hexes and at certain hexes you will have cities, you will have castles, you will have little huts, you have places and NPCs to visit. You can go there, you can get side quests. There are main quests. Uh, you will be sent into dungeons and when you go into a dungeon hex, you actually go in down into the in, deep into the ground into these really cool dungeons where the dungeons become these kind of like mini games where you progress from room to room doing combat or having to uh, overcome different challenges. 
There is uh, resource management and the fact that there's there's all these resources. Uh, healing is somewhat limited, so you have to be really careful about when and how you heal. There's different loot. Uh, there's uh, you can get all kinds of gold, and you can spend your gold on different different um, things when you go into a town. And then the the full game, like like kind of like the deluxe version of the game, I think it's the only one they sell now, has so many different modes. It has the main for the king mode. Then it has a whole game where you are playing in uh, going from island to island in these vast open seas. So instead of an overland crawl, it's a sea crawl. And then it has like an Arctic expedition mode. Then it has a pure dungeon crawling mode where all you're doing is going into dungeons. Um, there's just there is so much to this game. As you are playing the game, you are discovering these lore books. And this is the roguelike element because as you unlock more of these lore books, you are able to unlock beneficial events, uh, random events that will happen while you are playing in subsequent games. So while the earlier games are pretty difficult, it's a very challenging game. You're going to die and lose a lot. Slowly, you will be unlocking beneficial things to take into uh, future games to make those games a little easier. The roguelike... Um, the buildup of the game, the, the progress, the roguelike progress is pretty slow. I think a little slower than it needs to be. And so sometimes it does feel like you are spinning your wheels just a little bit. And that can be a problem in roguelike games. Uh, finding that balance between uh, allowing the player to discover new things, allowing the player to earn benefits for future games, and also keeping that... Um, that challenge level. That's that's the balance that all of these roguelike games need to get right. You know, games like um, I think Rogue Legacy 2 really does it well, and so does Dead Cells, but those are more like action games. Those don't really make me feel like I'm playing a board game. But those have that that carrot is on the perfect length stick to entice you to keep playing. For the king, I think the stick is a little bit too long. And the games can be quite long. However, you can save at any point. So this isn't this isn't a, a lot like a, it's a different feel for a roguelike game. You're not going to sit down and you're probably not going to complete a full game in one sitting. If you do, it will probably be pretty long unless you lose pretty, <laughs> pretty quickly. But that can happen. But um, if you are looking for just a, an overland crawl, it has so much adventure. And like I said, if you like Runebound, um, this is like a game for you. This is kind of like super deluxe Runebound with all of the expansions times two <laughs> built into the game. Just a fantastic game. So yeah, so the uh, the six games we covered today were Children of Morta, Curious Expedition 2, Citizen Sleeper, Guild of Dungeoneering, Tangle Deep, and For the King. Sorry, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed taking a look at uh, D6 great video games for Dungeon Divers. And we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.